Hello, namaste. Welcome to Deep's Hammer Show. This is the flagship weekly English talk show of Indigenous Television and ITV Nepal. In this talk show, I invite guests and discuss on various contemporary issues affecting on indigenous peoples and minority groups. Today, I have invited very esteemed guest. His name is Professor Oliver De Sauter. He is the UN Special Rapporteur on Extreme Poverty and Human Rights. Special Rapporteur is a special procedure of a Human Rights Council, which, is, uh, which consists of independent experts on the human rights systems. And it is a special procedure for fact-finding and monitoring mechanisms for addressing specific country as well as thematic issues around the world. So, uh, Professor Oliver D. Sutter, along with being a UN Special Rapporteur, is Professor of Law at the University of Clovin in Paris, mm -hmm. France, and uh, also a member of a Global Law School faculty at the New York University. And he did his LLM from Harvard University. And he has taught extensively the human rights in various renowned universities around the world. For instance, University of Leicester in UK, College of Europe, Columbia University, and New York, uh, Yale University as well, right? So, Professor Oliver is in Nepal for his mission, especially to examine Nepal government's efforts to alleviate the poverty. His mission actually started from November 29 and ending on December 9th. And while concluding his mission, he held a press conference to present his preliminary finding as well. So today I will be discussing with him about uh, what are the finding, major findings in his missions. So first of all, Your Excellency, uh, welcome to the show. And uh, I have given you a kind of background information or introduction about you. I think that is not sufficient. So could you introduce yourself a bit besides that what I introduced? Thank you very much. Uh, very delighted to be here. My role is uh, to report to the international community on the efforts that countries are putting into the fight against poverty. And I do this by country visits, such as the one I'm now closing in Nepal, in which I meet public officials, I meet communities, I meet uh, non-governmental organizations, civil society, in order to present the government with as comprehensive as possible a picture of the country, so that the government realizes which blind spots exist in public policies, which parts of legislation should be improved in order to strengthen the fight against poverty. And so my role is to listen, to watch. We are described sometimes as the, the eyes and ears of the international community in order to ensure that um, no community is forgotten from um, the, the public policies in place and that uh, the government is made aware of the challenges it is facing. To conclude your missions, actually, you uh, conducted a press meet and you presented a preliminary findings of your mission as well. And I would like to request you briefly present what are your findings uh, of the missions, if possible, relating with indigenous peoples and other minority groups like Dalit, Muslims and Madhesis. There is a big debate in Nepal as to how the diversity of the country can be taken into account in public policies. We know that the country is making progress. It is now graduating from being a least developed country to becoming a, um, a, a developing country. That's um, a very important moment. It shows that growth is um, uh, successful. But some parts of the country are left behind, and the, the Taru, the Madeshi, the Dalit, um, uh, for example, are not benefiting from general progress as other groups. Um, the government and the Nepalese society in general do acknowledge this, and that's, I think, the first step, uh, which is very important. In many countries, indigenous communities are not acknowledged, are ignored, are sometimes um, actively uh, uh, discriminated against in-state policy. This is not the case here. 
In Nepal, there are genuine efforts, I think, to improve the situation of these groups. But these efforts should be pursued further if they are to be successful. Um, a number of um, constitutional commissions are working on this issue, but their resources are insufficient and their recommendations not always followed upon. Um, there's a reservations policy in place for access to civil service being encouraged, but uh, progress is very slow, for example, for the Dalit. And so we need to do more and better. Um, notably to combat social discrimination, discrimination that occurs not in state policies and in legislation, but within families and communities, within the private sector. Um, many Dalit, for example, have difficulties in having access to um, quality education, uh, to good jobs uh, because of the discrimination they face in uh, the employment market. So that is something that requires time because you have to combat stereotypes and prejudice against these minorities. There is no doubt that the government of Nepal has taken a several steps to reduce the multidimensional poverty, right? So uh, what are some of the steps did you actually find which are really impressive during your interactions with the government or your observation in Nepal? during your 11 days mission? No, so I think what is uh, remarkable is that we have a large number of social protection schemes that have been put in place uh, over the years, including um, the old age allowance, the single women's allowance, uh, uh, the uh, uh, social security allowance, for example. Uh, but all these anti-poverty schemes um, have been developed in a very ad hoc way, not really coordinated with one another, not really um, consistent with one another, and sometimes without any economies of scale. Each of these schemes, for example, has defined its own set of beneficiaries um, without um, any single social registry to cover all the population. So for each of these schemes, there's a need to identify the people who should benefit uh, when one single database should, should allow to much more easily expand coverage for these schemes. Moreover, these schemes are important but still underfunded. Um, and uh, only a small part of the population is covered. Some estimates are that only 17% of the population of Nepal is covered by some form of social protection. This is certainly not enough. We need all the population to be covered from, from cradle to grave, from child allowances to old age pension, including with healthcare benefits, with unemployment benefits, with uh, disability allowances uh, to allow people to be protected by basic income security being guaranteed. And Nepal still has quite a long way to go to ensure this. So, uh, government actually uh, really uh, expressed its commitment uh, to reduce the poverty by the half uh, by introducing uh, the social protections by 2024. 20, uh, previously, as uh, during your uh, press briefing as well, you said that government briefed that government has introduced almost 70 or 80 different schemes, uh, like as you said. So, uh, from your statement, um, I just sense that these social protections which are not inadequate, which are inadequate. Do you mean that? The social protections that government introduced, which are inadequate? Well, I think quite apart from the fact that they don't cover all the population, it's important to realize that there's an important gap between legal coverage, in other terms, uh, what those schemes in principle should provide in terms of protection and effective coverage, what people effectively enjoy. Why? Well, because many people experience obstacles in having access to the schemes. For example, they don't have uh, proof of their citizenship, making it difficult for them to access the scheme. They don't have um, a birth certificate and therefore are denied access to child allowances. They are not informed about the scheme and therefore they don't claim the benefits they normally should have a right to. They don't uh, speak Nepali and as a result um, it is very difficult for them to um, read the information available or hear the information available from the radio and so they do not know which schemes can benefit them and which are the procedures to follow. So we have a big gap between the promises on paper, the legal coverage and the effective coverage. Um, that gap means 
the government should do much more outreaching efforts in uh, various languages so that all groups of the population effectively benefit by being properly informed about their rights and this is unfortunately not the case at the moment. So during your press meet you said that you met with the government officials, obviously you met with the ministers and representative of uh, different ministries as well. And you also said that you met with the representative of different commissions, including Indigenous Peoples Commissions, Adivasi Commissions, Muslims Commissions, Dalit Commissions. I just want to hear what were the reactions or their responses or concerns, especially raised by the Indigenous Peoples Commissions representatives from Dalit Commissions. What responses, what did they ask or what, what concerns did they raise? So, these meetings were extremely helpful also because they allowed me to understand uh, the role of these constitutional commissions. They are important to have, but unless they are better resources, resourced, unless they have more means to function, and unless their recommendations um, are followed upon by the government, they will have a limited impact. So, one of my um, proposals to the government is not only to better support these commissions, but also to ensure that the government uh, commits to respond to the recommendations made. Um, for example, there is a, a, a Madeshi commission that, is, that I met with, and they presented some 400 recommendations to the government, only a small fraction of which have actually led to some reaction um, from the government. So, I think that's the first point. They, their status of these constitutional commissions should be enhanced in order for their um, uh, role in decision making to be, to be uh, improved. Apart from this, they of course described to me the difficulties the Dalit, uh, the Madeshi, the Tao, for example, experience in their daily lives um, in um, Nepal. And um, we discussed a lot the reservations policy um, and other tools that the government is using in order to improve the situation. Right. Uh, during your 11 days mission to Nepal, you also visited uh, different provinces like province number two, as well as Bagmati province, Lumbini, Karnali provinces also you visited, you said. And also you, you interacted with the communities. You also interacted with government officials. You heard their commitment, government's commitment, right? And you also visited to the ground. And uh, what differences did you find the government commitment at the center and the ground real reality at the bottom? Did you find any differences there? I think what was striking to me um, is the, the fact that, first of all, many of the efforts of the, of the uh, government um, are now uh, difficult to implement because of the division of tasks between the federal, provincial and local government levels. There is sometimes a lack of understanding as to who is responsible for what. The federalization process um, has added a layer of complexity to public policies uh, that I hope will be um, clarified in the next few years. I think that's a major challenge. Um, I also think um, many concrete problems of the um, uh, different communities, the different nationalities um, should um, be fed into governmental policies in a much more systematic way. To do this, improved participation of representatives of these communities in decision making would be useful. And uh, that is the only way for the government to be well informed about their needs. Um, you can't make a difference if you only operate top-down without um, involving people in decision-making and respecting the right to participation of minorities. So uh, this, as you stated, that this COVID-19 actually impacted not only Nepal but across the globe. And during this COVID-19, many Delhi Oasis actually lost their reserve. And your part of the mission is to see the social protections or social protections that introduced by government. And another point that you said, how Nepal government actually guaranteed access to the land, right? So access to the land is one of the problems that indigenous peoples actually have raised. And what did you find? What were the observations in regards to access to the land? Well, I, I think two things are striking. First of all, the efforts uh, of either rehabilitating former bonded laborers or providing land to the landless Dalit, both of which are promises of the constitution, um, 
although these efforts are underway, they are not sufficient, and the National Land Commission has not been able to accelerate progress in this regard. And secondly, perhaps even more striking, I met communities, the, the Badi community, for example, the Gandarwa community, um, who, although they live on settlements since 25, 26 years, um, were not able to register the land um, um, in their own name and so are not considered owners of the land, despite the fact that the 1964 Land Act um, um, in principle ensures that um, uh, people who occupy land since more than 10 years should have access to a title. So I think more could be done in this regard. The government is attentive to this, I think, um, but the ability for people to get land registered in their own name remain, um, remains limited and, and there is a need to accelerate the process. So in terms of this extreme poverty or the poverty label, some economists actually have said that there is a gap between the indigenous peoples and non-indigenous peoples. And what they also have stated that rather than, uh, you know, getting smaller of uh, this poverty level, rather the poverty, the gap e has been widening, right? So I have a book, actually this is published, uh, that is the perspective of indigenous peoples as well. I, I will hand over to you a study on the so uh, socioeconomic status of indigenous peoples in Nepal, which was conducted in 2000. Uh, and 24, 2014. I will hand, hand you over you. this, right? So uh, this shows that the indigenous peoples actually consist in Nepal. One fourth of the populations actually they are, they represent or they make up the, you know, poor community. So in that sense, what are your recommendations for the government of Nepal so that government can reach to the poorest of the poor? Well, I made a number of recommendations to the government, including to um, focus on access to land for those who today are actually still in, in bonded labor. I met, for example, with uh, uh, a community in province number two, um, um, made of people, um, um, Dalit uh, communities, who were unable to um, move away from their situation of over indebtedness towards the, the landlord. Uh, so they were performing work for the landlord, all the family for the full year, at the end of which they receive some um, uh, rice and, 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 and two quotas of land um, in order to produce their own food. But they live in quasi-slavery conditions because of their inability to um, have access to land um, as in accordance with the promise of the Constitution. So um, I think the focus should be on, on these people um, in the short term. You know, the Kamaya um, um, uh, system of bonded labor was abolished formally in 2002 by legislation, but in reality it remains uh, a widespread practice and, and we should really uh, try to accelerate um, land redistribution in order to avoid this being perpetuated. So last question is, as you, you already concluded your 11 day missions and you will be presenting your final report in June next year, in this between the people or representative who have not been able to meet you or you know uh, just support you contribute to you in that sense how you know they can actually uh, pass their concern in this period so that uh, you know their voices is being heard in your report as well so the report will be presented to the government in march already um, for the government to provide uh, with its comments uh, before the final report is presented to the international community. So if uh, between now and the 1st of March people want to make submissions to inform my, my views and, and, and to ensure that the report takes into account the updated information I need, uh, these people are more than welcome. So I encourage uh, uh, all those who have an interest in the issue of combating poverty in Nepal to provide submissions before 1st of March. Thank you, Professor, for your time and Stin actually thought that you presented, you gave a time to the indigenous television. Many thanks indeed. Thank you. We have come to the end of the show. Uh, today uh, I had invited very esteemed guest, um, Professor Oliver de Sauter, who is the UN Special Rapporteur on Extreme Poverty and Human Rights. We, uh, I actually discussed about the uh, 
the poverty and in relations with the indigenous peoples and other minorities in today's uh, discussion. Next week, I will come uh, with a new guest to discuss a new topic. Uh, by then, uh, have a nice weekend. If you have any queries or feedbacks, you can reach me at indigenoustelevision at, uh, at gmail.com. By then, have a nice weekend. Namaste.